the idyllic villages that cling to our coastline. Known for their beauty and serenity. Oh, it's wonderful to see that sailor. Now destinations for our leisure. But once they played a vital role in our history. This is amazing. I'm Ben Robinson, and as an archaeologist, I'm intrigued by our coastal villages because there's always a bigger story behind that idyllic postcard image. I've come to Parkgate on the Wirral Peninsula in Cheshire. It's 12 miles from the city of Chester and next to the shallow estuary of the River Dee. All but forgotten is Parkgate's pivotal role in forging relations between England and Ireland. It's not in any textbook that I've ever seen, it's not taught in any schools, and it really ought to be. More people should know about this place. I'll uncover the hidden clues to its maritime heyday. Oh, good grief. That is incredible. And I'll discover why this once thriving village by the sea isn't quite as coastal as it once was. There's a fascinating story to this village by the sea. I'm approaching Parkgate with skipper Ian Marland, who's been navigating these waters for 40 years. I'm in the estuary of the River Dee in Cheshire. I've got Chester in that direction there. Over there is the Irish Sea. And I'm getting my first glimpse at Parkgate. And it looks like a typical seaside place. It's got that jolly white paint scheme, what looks like hotels looking out onto the waterfront. I'm getting an image of buckets and spades and promenades and all that kind of thing. Can we go and take a closer look? No, unfortunately we can't. We can't. We're on the edge of the marsh here and there's just no water to get any closer. But it looks like we're in the middle of this massive expanse of sea. What sort of depth of water have we got now? We've got 3.2 feet underneath us is now. That, is that That's all? It, yeah. And it actually gets shallower and shallower yeah. and shallower? Yeah, if we went another 100 yards that way, we'd literally touch on. And it's extraordinary because 250 years ago, this would have been a bustling port. There would have been ships there jostling for space, importing and exporting things like cotton, linen, cattle, wine, but also people. Because this was the place where tens of thousands of Irish immigrants landed. And they came in hope and expectation of a better life on these shores. Parkgate can be traced back to the former Neston Deer Park, which closed in 1599. One of the earliest references to the place was around 1610, when it was noted that shipping was being handled at the Park Gate, where an entrance to the Deer Park is understood to have been. The village is no longer beside navigable waters, but you can still find clues to its maritime past as a busy port. Ah, oh, here we go little run of cottages here and they've had a modern makeover but they look 19th century maybe earlier and perhaps the sort of place that laborers would have lived in but here there's something much much earlier look at that roof there it's got big welsh slates on it and welsh slate in most parts of the country comes in in the mid 19th century with the railways but here of course north wales is just across there so they'd have got hold of this great roofing material earlier and this wall is about of that period as well look at that lovely old red brick in there and oh look ha 
This is interesting. Pangwern was once the home of a wealthy mariner, Charles Salisbury, captain and ship owner. Now, he died in 1733. I want to take a closer look at this building. OK, well, this is a much grander affair than the cottages here. So something befitting a sea captain, someone who's investing in a new home, who's making money out of the place. And I'm starting to get a sense of somewhere where there is money to be made, even as early as the early 18th century. I've just spotted another clue here about the maritime past of Parkgate. It's a slipway, and this is where boats would have been drawn down off the higher land onto a channel and out to sea. And although it's got a tarmac surface now, you can see the original stone flags under here. But it's obviously been a very, very long time since any boat came down off of here onto the water. You just can't get to it. That boat is going nowhere. Oh, this quirky little building draws my eye. That window up there would have offered observation out over the main channel. This is where the customs officials kept watch on the shipping that was going backwards and forwards. It's another insight into the importance of trade and commerce here. They had customs officials keeping an eye on everything. All along the waterfront, there's clear evidence that around 300 years ago, trade in Parkgate was thriving. But to find out why this was such an important port in the 17th and 18th centuries, we need to know what was going on at Chester, just up the river. Chester had been a major port since Roman times, trading goods with the wider empire. Over time, the River Dee slowly silted up and the city became unreachable. By the later 1600s, Parkgate took over as the principal port on the English side of the Dee. I've got a copy of a really beautiful map in front of me here. It's a new and exact survey of the River Dee, or Chester Water, dated 1689, and it's by Captain Grenville Collins. Now, Collins was the Royal Hydrographer. That's the Royal Maritime Map Maker. And he's produced a splendid map here. It's a work of art, but also so important because for the first time in detail, it charts the hazards here in the estuary. So all the bits of sand that were exposed at half tides and he's marked on the deeper water anchorages. This is where the larger boats could moor up without fear of running aground at low tide. It's absolutely priceless because before this map was produced, navigating these treacherous waters was a matter of intuition, local knowledge and luck. And you couldn't afford to take gambles here because these ships were carrying valuable cargo. But he also did something else special. He put Park Gate on the map for the very first time. <music> Author and Park Gate resident Dr. Anthony Anakin Smith has studied how Chester's silted up shipping channels led to a boost in Park Gate's fortunes. So you brought me to the Old Key pub, and I guess that means something. Well, that's right, it very much does, Ben. The pub was named after a shipping quay, which used to be about a mile upriver from here. The water was better here in Parkgate, and particularly at the north end of the village, there was a very deep area of water where ships could anchor with certainty, and that's really where, where Parkgate grew up and the village developed from that over the 17th and 18th centuries. But you've done some research on this area in particular. Yeah, I believe this was a place of shipbuilding because you have the buildings of Parkgate which are all laid out in one line and then suddenly at this point the buildings are um, set back slightly. You can imagine this would have created a wonderful space here um, which would have been suitable for shipbuilding. And documentary evidence shows that the chap who lived in the early 18th century in Seawood House there, he was a shipwright or shipbuilder 
So when you put all the evidence together, it seems very much that this is where shipbuilding was going on. And of course, shipbuilding is attracting other trades and other people as well, labour coming in from, from everywhere. Yes, that's right. I mean, Parkgate had multifacets, um, but all based principally around the trade to Ireland and particularly to Dublin, because Dublin in the 18th century was the second largest English-speaking city in the world. So you get this huge movement of people and of goods going between England and Ireland, and, and principally between Dublin and Parkgate. Although Parkgate handled huge cargo ships, it also became well known for its passenger trade, as nobility, gentry and dignitaries chose to take advantage of its superior road links to major cities, such as London. Parkgate grew by taking advantage of this trade that was to serve the travellers and the traders that were coming ashore here. And one of the first things that I've seen is this, the Red Lion pub. And I can tell it's been extended over time. And what that tells me is that business is booming, expanding, the place is growing. Oh, brilliant. You knew I was coming, John. Absolutely. <laughs> now, you manage this pub, but do you know how old it is? Uh, dates back, the first licensee was 1788, but originally this was three cottages. So the first bit of the pub was where we're standing now, and then it's been expanded either way into both cottages. So they've bought up the properties next door and expanded into yeah. them? Yeah, they have. Now, in times gone by, there were some pretty underhand tricks to make sure people came and spent their money. Yeah, so in the past, apparently, they used to send runners out to say there was a ship coming in, and uh, sometimes there wasn't. <laughs> So it would get people to park gates and get people drinking and, and more trade. <laughs> and once they were here, that was it. They were just yep. captive. After the first one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll drink to that. Thanks very much. No problem at all. Cheers. Cheers. challenging tides of the River Dee and the uncertainties of the weather and the wind meant that travellers to and from Ireland often had to wait days, even weeks, before they could get safe passage. So hostelries like this grew up to service their needs. Now, the reviews were a bit mixed, and there's some contemporary accounts here. Uh, in 1730, one Dudley Bradstreet ran out of money and he wrote, From Chester I went to Parkgate, having but 26 shillings left, and lodged at one of the best houses in that extorting village. In four days my stock of money was reduced to 10 shillings, so he's being milked for his money here. And when Letitia Pilkington made the crossing about 1748, she too ran out of funds and she wrote, the next day we set out for Parkgate, which was crowded with nobility and gentry waiting for a fair wind. Here we were so long detained that my purse was quite exhausted. It's amazing, even in the 18th century, people are complaining about the prices they're being charged in tourist traps. But it wasn't just pleasure seekers and high society who saw Parkgate as a destination port. Between 1750 and 1800, it received tens of thousands of Irish migrants. Dr Gillian O'Brien has studied why there was such a large influx of people to this village. This bit is a little bit different. It sticks out from the sea wall. Yeah, well, what's interesting about this is this may have been the place of people going off the boats, but they weren't coming off the big ships because the big ships had to dock slightly further out because this was too shallow. So they would then decant their passengers into much smaller vessels, which would sail up and the passengers would get off here and then they would go to enjoy the delights of Parkgate. So this was the place where people from Ireland first set foot on English soil, looking for a, a new life, perhaps. Absolutely. And it was here that their next sort of step of their journeys would take, whether that was to remain close to Parkgate or to go much further afield. But when I think of Irish immigration, I think of Liverpool and big places like that. We don't think of places like Parkgate. I think it's partly we don't think of it because it hasn't been a port for so long. But actually, its story is really important because you have the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and you have the beginning of people coming in large numbers over here for looking for work. 
Industrial Revolution. That's interesting because that's mushrooming across England, isn't it? But that's not happening in Ireland. No, I mean, there's very little industrial development in Ireland, but the Irish population is growing massively. And so this is a land in many ways of opportunity. So there's presumably labourers coming for seasonal work as well. Yeah, there's a huge amount of seasonal work because the harvest in Ireland came a little later. So you'd come over, you'd do your seasonal harvesting here, and then you'd go back to Ireland and do the harvest there. And it was a way of sort of making money over a longer period of time. Why specifically Parkgate? Well, they're coming here because it's one of sort of the big ports bringing you into Britain at the time. So you can come to Hollyhead or you can come here. And in many ways, it was an advantage to go to Parkgate. So because even though you were longer at sea, it meant that you didn't have that extra 60 miles of awful roads that took you from Hollyhead to Chester. So if you could get to Parkgate, which was obviously dependent on tides and the weather, this was the place to come to. Now, presumably, some of the Irish immigrants that came over didn't flourish. Not everyone succeeded. No, I mean, that's very true. And in Parkgate, you do have the examples of vagrants being sent home under the poor law rules. And the parish was supposed to look after them, but they wanted to repatriate them and send them home because it took an expense of a parish. And they were sometimes people who were begging on the street, but you also get the enterprising migrant worker who may well have decided that they want to go back because the harvest is about to happen in Ireland. And they almost deliberately get themselves picked up because they then will have their fare paid to bring them back home. It's incredible, really. I mean, when you look at it today, to think of this place so busy so, and so important to Irish history. Is it known in Ireland today? No, it's not in any textbook that I've ever seen. It's not taught in any schools, and it really ought to be. More people should know about this place and its place in history, because Little Parkgate was one of the links in the chain that binds our two countries together. Parkgate was not just a launch pad for Ireland, its reach extended far beyond the Irish Sea. And there's one house in particular that might hold a clue as to how far that reach went. Ah, uh, here we are. It's a terrace of 18th century houses. You can see they've all got steps to keep them up off the grubby street and maybe to make sure that the high tides don't wash into them. Now, not so long ago, this particular house yielded a great treasure to its then owners. Now, not many people get to see this, but I've been invited in. The house is called Seven Steps, and its current owner, Jill, will be giving me the grand tour. Thanks very much for having me here. It's Come fantastic. Oh, wow. Look at this. Look at this great old beam here. It's fabulous, isn't it? This goes with the early date of the house, the early 1700s. And the stair as well, this narrow turning stair. This is all original stuff. And this is not the best. What? <laughs> There's more? All right. <laughs> Come on. Right, are you ready for this? Look. Oh, wowee. I know. That is incredible. I didn't expect this at all. Wall paintings, they go right back to medieval times, but in an 18th century house, it's really quite unusual. How were they discovered? Well, Cheryl, who we bought the house from, her family had lived here for 170 years. And back in the 1990s, the wallpaper was all bubbly and she's scraping it off. And lo and behold, there it was. Just extraordinary. And there are clues to the date here because there's a tall ship there under full sail, all its rigging, but it's flying what looks like the ensign there. Right. So it's a merchant navy ship or it's a royal navy ship. And it looks, yeah, it looks late 18th, early 19th century. But the view itself doesn't look very English. It looks like it's depicting some foreign land. It looks somewhere. tropical, doesn't it? And it's not just here is it? I mean, there's oh, some no. over here. No, it's as well. over here. We've got it. This is very interesting. This is a really interesting find. It's like they've they've painted tiles. Oh, they have. Those the are sort around. of mimicked Dutch tiles, aren't yeah. they? But do you know what? I've just noticed something here. Ships scratched oh, on gosh, here. Oh gosh, yes. Do you know I've never noticed that? 
I mean, it's almost like a graffiti. So people maybe were, you know, waiting up here or they've taken lodgings or are just a little bit bored and frustrated. And they've been scratched over they've, the painting. They've kind of desecrated it in a way because you can see there's the scene behind. It's almost as if these paintings were acting as sort of adverts, yeah. saying to people who come in this room, Parkgate's all about what's going on out there in yeah. the sea and the wider world. And it makes you wonder who it was that painted these scenes. What does it feel like to own this property and have these wonderful things? It's an absolute joy to have this part of history. We're, we're just the next stage in the house's life. We're just custodians. A complete surprise. I didn't <laughs> expect anything like this. Wonderful. So it's clear that shipping and travel was ingrained in the fabric of Parkgate society. And by the 1730s, the village was enjoying its status as a thriving port. But everything was about to change. Once again, Parkgate's fortunes were tied to the shifting silt of the D estuary. In an attempt to reopen Chester as a major port, in 1737, a new channel was excavated from the city to Connors Quay, eight miles on the Welsh side of the estuary. This new cut, as it was known, allowed Chester to continue to function as a port. Unfortunately, this new channel increased the silting in Parkgate's waters. And by the early 1800s, the channels here were so shallow that the boat business had been lost to the growing ports of Holyhead and Liverpool. Although Parkgate had lost the deep water port, it still boasted a beach. And around 1810, a very important structure was built to service its flourishing tourist trade. Now, this is Parkgate's sea wall, and it wasn't a quayside. This is not where boats were moored against. There's no tethering rings, there's no mooring posts here, and you can see it's on a slope. This was built purely to create a level, dry surface for visitors to promenade along the seafront. And this is only the top third of the structure. The rest is buried beneath this silt and marsh. But you can see the sort of investment that's going into the place as a resort by the sheer scale of this structure. It stretches from one end of the village right to the other. It's an enormous thing and it's just designed to keep the people of Parkgate's feet dry as they walk along the seafront. But Parkgate's tourist trade wasn't just reliant on holiday makers. Village entrepreneurs had spotted a money-making opportunity from a new medicinal craze, seawater bathing. Dr. Catherine Ferry has studied the regrowth of Parkgate's seaside success. Catherine, when did this fashion for sea bathing come into being? It was really about the middle of the 18th century when doctors started prescribing sea bathing as the latest cure-all. You've got to remember, there wasn't much else, you know, no antibiotics, no quick pill you can take. If you're unwell, doctors began to recommend not just the cold seawater, but the fact that seawater had all these mineral salts in it. And that was supposed to be better than inland spa water. And what did the treatment actually involve? It was actually quite a, a horrible experience, probably. <laughs> so you're going to be prescribed by your doctor a series of dips meted out by a woman called a dipper. And she would grab you by the shoulders and forcibly plunge you under the water until you felt like you were drowning. And then lift you up, spluttering. But the idea was this was a kind of reboot almost, you know, to, to shock your body into good health. And that would also be combined with a detox, I suppose we call it now, where you drink seawater. 
to purge your whole body. So it's a regimen. You had to do it in the prescribed way for it to be medically effective. Is there any science at all that backs up these doctors that were busily prescribing this? I mean, they, they took evidence, they measured people's recovery, measured people's stools and that kind of thing, oh, okay. you know, and actually published this information um, because it was important for people thinking about coming to a particular place like Parkgate to know that the seawater here was effective. So you had to give examples, you know, the doctors were, were touting for business almost here. And you have to consider that the people who've got the money to afford those kind of doctors are noble, they're gentry families. So if you had seawater next to you, it was, you know, it was a real opportunity for entrepreneurial people to actually get some investment in, get some people coming with money. And we're standing by this particular house because this has an association with someone very famous indeed. That's right. Emma Hamilton is supposed to have stayed in 1784 when she was about 19 or 20. because She's better known as the mistress of Nelson. She came here because she had a skin complaint and she did the, the seawater bathing cure. And evidently it was very successful because she went on to become an artist's muse and a celebrity of her generation. And celebrity endorsers, celebrity influencers, presumably help your market. If they chat amongst their friends and say, look, I went, it was a marvellous cure, look, I'm so much better. That's great, that's marketing for the place. It's absolutely crucial. It was all about creating that sense of exclusivity. Parkgate is on the up. But sadly, Parkgate's sea bathing heyday wasn't to last. What I can see in front of me now is vast acres of salt water marsh. This is an absolute paradise for bird watchers, but it's the reason why Parkgate couldn't continue as a port, and it's the reason why Parkgate couldn't go on to develop as a seaside resort. Now, the excavation of the new cut in the mid 18th century over on that side of the estuary hastened the growth of this marsh and the silting, but so too did the introduction of special marsh grass in the 1920s. This was designed to stop the silting, but it drifted across and actually built up the marsh. This was an unintended consequence of trying to use nature to fight nature and it's cut Parkgate off from the sea. Parkgate is probably best known today as the seaside village with no sea. And its maritime heyday may have only lasted a hundred years or so, but what a legacy. People came to Parkgate from all walks of life, and these people helped to shape two countries, Ireland and England. And they helped forge a bond that will remain forever. <laughs> <laughs>